This is part four of our four-part series on European rearmament. If you want to check out parts one, two, or three, simply follow the links in the description. Otherwise, if you don't mind picking up partway through the story and focusing on the wider theatre of Europe, here is part four. Part four. Leopards. For lagoons. So the war in Ukraine has been a huge strategic shock. It isn't a shock that started in 2022. This is a conflict that's been going on since 2014 in one way or another. So there'd already been a big shift in kind of European thinking about Russia as a threat and in thinking about defence and the need for defence spending and maintaining both the armed forces, but also the defence industrial bases and workforces that supply those armed forces with the equipment and technology that they need. James Black is the Assistant Director of the Defence and Security Research Group at RAND Europe and the lead for the Defence Strategy, Policy and Capability Research portfolio at RAND, as well as the European lead for the RAND Space Enterprise Initiative and advisors at the Centre for Defence Economics and Acquisition. Beyond RAND though, he's also a non-resident NATO 2030 Fellow and has provided strategy and policy to groups ranging from the UK MOD to NATO to the Australian, Finnish and Norwegian armies and even the US defence agencies. And on top of that, he's also actively involved in wargaming, including as the lead designer of strategic exercises at the Royal College of Defence Studies. And we're thrilled to have him on the program today. A number of countries across Europe had already taken steps to increase their defence spending. There'd, there'd then been the election of Donald Trump, which had further heightened the pressure on European allies within NATO to do more and to get closer to, if not meet, the 2% of GDP target that NATO has for spending as well as some of the other subsidiary targets that NATO has around how that money gets spent. So spending more money on kit and new technology rather than just spending money on salaries and pensions for soldiers, for example. So there was already a lot of that activity, but, but really activity is accelerated in the last year with the invasion of February 2022. So there's been a lot of short-term pressure to just get troops and vehicles and kit ready and out the door and supported and maintained and repaired and all these sorts of things. And then of course, there's been the added pressure of then giving lots of equipment as well as training and, and other kind of wider support to the Ukrainian armed forces who are obviously fighting, you know, a very bloody and, and for them existential war with, with Russia. That has really exposed the shortcomings in stockpiles and in readiness of equipment. So both the number of assets that we have in, in, the, in militaries across Europe, but also, you know, how well repaired they are, how ready they are to go, how well trained people are to use them, you know, what the lead times are for getting them deployed somewhere they can do something useful. It's really put a lot of pressure on all of those kind of logistics systems uh, and stockpiles and it's exposed that there isn't really enough of some of the things that you would need in a high-end war. And obvious examples are things like ammunition and missiles, where the Ukrainians have been burning through artillery shells at a rate that is far, 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 far beyond you know, anything that NATO experienced fighting in Afghanistan or Iraq, for example. You know, by orders of magnitude, they're burning through kind of thousands of shells. And there are only so many in your stockpiles. So the question then becomes, how quickly can you replenish stuff? But also, what do you need to replenish? So there is there is both the kind of near-term pressure to buy and ship stuff that the Ukrainians need for their immediate operations against the Russians. And then there is a slightly longer-term question around what less can we learn from the Ukrainian fighting experience with the Russians? You know, what technology does work and doesn't work? You know, where are we seeing innovation in terms of tactics and equipment that perhaps we should be learning about ourselves in Western Europe and incorporating into the, the military equipment that we design and use for the future? All these sorts of questions. So we're having to both kind of rearm and recapitalize for the near term for our own benefit and at the same time think about the Ukrainian needs, and at the same time think about why the, the equipment that we might need in the future might be slightly different to the equipment that the Ukrainians are using right now. The war in Ukraine has really been a great demonstration of economics over strength, with consumer-grade drones, cheaper Turkish drones, and improvised surveillance being absolute game changers on the battlefield in Ukraine. After seeing the successes with this technology, do you think this will shape the purchasing patterns of some of the Western powers going forward? Yeah, this is this is a kind of debate that's been going on for for decades in defence, but it has really accelerated in in recent years with the advent of new technologies such as autonomy and robotics and drones and, and stuff like that. 
which is whether you should be looking to ever more advanced, more exquisite, more highly capable, but therefore more expensive high-end systems that have got all of the bells and whistles, they're gold-plated, they can do anything you like in anything, any context, and they can do it very well, but they're ruinously expensive, and so you can only afford a very small number of them. Or are you better off going for kind of cheap and cheerful solutions largely using commercial kind of civilian technologies that have then been adapted in a relatively minor way for military use, which you can buy in large numbers and you can just throw at the problem. And it doesn't really matter from a kind of cost perspective if you lose some of those assets because they weren't very expensive to begin with. So that's a kind of been a, a tension that's been playing out for, for a while. And there, there's this idea that gets discussed in kind of the US defense context that they were looking at analogy that gets drawn when they were thinking about fighter aircraft, which is that every new generation of fighter aircraft, it's got better sensors, better engines, it's stealthier, it's got all the different bells and whistles. But they get more and more expensive, so you can't have as many of them. And if you were to actually extrapolate those trends far enough into the future, you'd eventually reach the point where you basically have the Starship Enterprise. So you have some highly kind of capable single vessel, but you can only afford one of them. And there's a kind of running joke within kind of defense economists, which admittedly is a pretty niche comedy scene. But um, it's the kind of running joke that you get to a point where, you know, the Marine Corps can have it on the weekends, the Navy get it Monday through Wednesday, and the Air Force get it, you know, in the afternoons on a Thursday. You end up having to share fewer and fewer assets, and they're called upon to do more and more things. So faced with the kind of pressures of cost growth and cost escalation in defense equipment, the solution would seem to be to try and go for more of a mix of high and low, a high-low mix, and get a small number of very capable assets to do the things that you really, really need them to do and that nothing else you know, is good enough for. And then lots and lots of cheap and cheerful civilian drones and stuff like that to, do, to give you mass and to give you quantity at an affordable price. The drones, the tanks, the artillery, the planes, these are all very much required. But is there a worry that they're putting too many eggs in just a few baskets? and pushing aside the Navy in particular, and that if a future conflict pops up that is more naval focused, that the European powers may be stuck in the same situation of being caught unprepared for that war all over again. There's a recurring theme in defense strategy if you look over the last few decades or even centuries, which is that militaries generally prepare for the last war. We have a set of assumptions around what war would look like in the 1980s, which would be that you'd be fighting the Russians and it would be superpower versus superpower, capitalism versus communism, potentially nuclear war. And then actually what, what rolled about in the, you know, after the Soviet Union collapse was you had an intervention against Iraq in early 1990s, you had humanitarian interventions in the Balkans late in the 1990s. And then you had the war on terror, which was, you know, fighting insurgents armed with AK-47s and improvised explosive devices and Toyota pickup trucks, um, not fighting, you know, state actors with sophisticated proper militaries. We, th we then thought that the future of war was counterinsurgency and counterterrorism, and then suddenly Russia came back on the scene in everyone's minds. And so there is this kind of recurring pattern of potentially fighting the last war if you're not careful. So there absolutely is a danger that we focus exclusively on Ukraine and tell ourselves that this, you know, this tells us what the future of war will look like, when in fact it tells us what the future of war in a specific context will look like. And the type of war that you would need to prepare for against Russia which is inherently likely to be more land-centric because of the geography of, of Europe, is very different potentially to the type of war that the US is thinking about. It might have to fight against China at some point in the future, where obviously there isn't that much land in the Pacific Ocean. It's quite a lot of water, quite a lot of distance. And so the kind of forces and force structures that you would design to solve a problem like defending Taiwan, for example, against China, would look very different, given the emphasis on, on naval and air capabilities, to the kind of force that you might design for dealing with Russia. Equally, even when you're talking about Russia, there's a question about, for individual NATO countries, what do they contribute to any collective NATO effort? And do, how do they best specialise? Because not everyone can do everything. And this is certainly a live debate in the UK at the moment, for example, where if you look at the UK's defence reviews and spending reviews over the last kind of five years, 10 years, you could argue that the Navy has actually done very well there. And it's the the army and particularly the kind of armoured force of the British Army that has really suffered from under, kind of chronic underinvestment for a number of years. 
focus more on naval and, and air and cyber and space and those sorts of power projection. You know, that may make sense for the UK as an island nation to the northwest of Europe. But it only makes sense if there are other people in Europe who are then spending money on, you know, tanks and armored vehicles and other things to offset. So this this then brings you to the question of coordination. And this is an area where historically there have been a lot of kind of well-meaning political initiatives to improve the coordination of defense spending and capability development across Europe or across NATO. But the reality is that they haven't gone far enough or really succeeded. So even if we push aside the worry that moving to this land-centric, armor-heavy doctrine may not work well for future battles in rural Mali or the narrow mountain roads of Taiwan, how long are these changes actually going to take to be rolled out? And how difficult will it be to pivot back to a different strategy if we see another large geopolitical event come to pass? On that, on that first question, things take time. You know, there is no quick solution. The best time to have started to order all the stuff you now need for Ukraine would have been many years ago. But you can't just click your fingers and suddenly hundreds of new tanks or thousands of new missiles or whatever run off of a production line. It's always difficult if you have underinvested in a capability to build it back up at speed, uh, certainly without incurring very large financial costs. And that's because it's not just a question of pumping more products out of a factory. It's whether you even have the people and skills in sufficient numbers to staff that factory. And then to, once you've produced whatever the product is, take it into service in the military, train people on how to use it, and then deploy it, and then wrap around it all of the other stuff that goes around equipment to make a capability. Because it's not just kit that gives you a capability. You know, you could have as many tanks or planes as you like, but if you haven't got the pilots, you haven't got the ground crew, you haven't got the logistics and the supply chains, you haven't worked out your tactics, techniques and procedures, you haven't you know, integrated that keep capability with all of your other systems, you, know, you haven't made sure the radios talk to each other and all these sorts of things, it's not going to be terribly useful. And all of that is very complex and, and takes time. So there is a kind of dilemma here for Western countries as to how much they prioritise their near-term needs. So should they just produce stuff that we already have designed and the kind of proven technologies and try and pump as many of those out as quickly as possible to meet near-term needs. That reduces the risk that there is in the next kind of one to five years, that probably reduces the risk that you face, but maybe increases the risk that you face five to 10 years in, because what it means is you've spent a whole load of money on today's technology, but you had, you've underinvested in tomorrow's technology. So maybe then the future threat, you, you find yourself off in a, a worse situation. So that's one kind of temporal dilemma they face. What about continental integration? Surely we can solve a lot of these financial crunches and almost double our output by simply integrating Europe's defense industries, making one super industry rather than lots of little boutique ones, following the exact same model as the European auto, manufacturing, agricultural sectors. Is there a chance that the EU will go down that road? There's been a lot of political initiatives in this space. There's been a lot of kind of well-meaning statements going back kind of 20 years. The European Commission has really tried to push hard to get European nations to spend more of their defence spending on European programmes rather than just national programmes and to avoid the kind of fragmentation of the market and to try and encourage more economies of scale and, and not have seven different companies that are all pretty bad at making the same thing rather than merging them to create one market, one proper European defence market. But it's really struggled. And even with the new European Defence Fund and other initiatives where the EU is spending more money, it's still ultimately a small player compared to the money being spent at the national level. So that means you have to change the decision making at the national level. And there, there's all sorts of reasons why there hasn't been a more decisive shift towards consolidation of the industrial base. There are certainly kind of nationalistic pride reasons. People like having the ability to make military kits it's a source of fiscal pride. It's a sort. It's an opportunity for politicians to have photos of them in tanks riding around, looking like strong, decisive leaders. So there is a big P and a small P political angle to it. There's also obviously a, a question around jobs and the economy. And it's not just that you know working in the defense industry and the wider supply chain, because there is a huge supply chain of people who probably don't think of themselves as working in the defense industry, but they will be making small parts that are fed up into the defense industry and then used to make aircraft or tanks or whatever. We're talking about tens or hundreds of thousands of people. Those are rightly decision makers want to protect those jobs. Many of those jobs are often also clustered in certain regions. 
So shipbuilders, as you'd expect, are next to the sea. Often they are in regions that don't have huge numbers of other kind of major employers. And so perhaps the shipyard is the big anchor employer in that region. And if they go out of business, that's going to affect that, that entire cities and regions. And they also want the exports. If you sell a French jet to someone in the Middle East or somewhere else, that brings billions of euros of return potentially to the economy. And then finally, yeah, the military absolutely have a role to play here as well, because the, there has been a tendency to, first of all, to kind of emphasize national requirements and not be willing to compromise on them. So, you know, when designing a new aircraft, every military will define the specifications that aircraft has to meet slightly differently, and they will feel that those are all desperately important, and they may well be true. But the reality is if they were willing to compromise on a few of those requirements and cooperate with other people, they might actually be able to afford more of those aircraft, they might be cheaper, you know, supplies might be easier, those sorts of things. And then the final bit for the military is, is the security supply. So if you are fighting a war and you're using foreign equipment, can you be 100% sure that the foreign supplier of that equipment, even if it's a close ally, is gonna look after your needs in a war? And this is where there's issues of trust if you're buying a foreign fighter aircraft, for example, there's a lot of software in there that you might not even have seen the code for as a customer. And so you are kind of relying on, by, by trust and by faith, that there is nothing in that software that you, know, you wouldn't want to be there. Uh, and you're relying on your ally to be there to fix that software for you in a war if something goes wrong and not to just prioritize their own needs. So it ultimately comes down to these kind of really difficult questions of sovereignty and pride and, and money. And, and so there is a case to be made for coordinating more because ultimately you get more bang for your buck if you spend money efficiently together. But you have to overcome some really messy politics at the kind of local, regional and national level to, to get to that, unfortunately. Well, whilst Europe are all focused on Ukraine, many here on the other side of the planet are still keeping a nervous eye on Taiwan. So Ukraine was in a bit of a lucky position that they could be supplied so easily, sharing a direct border with NATO and surrounded by other former Warsaw Pact nations who had large stockpiles of the armaments the Ukraine uses just sitting around. A very different situation to what Taiwan currently sits in. So in a few years' time, if there was a somewhat surprise invasion of Taiwan by China, like Ukraine, there might only be a few weeks before the war is decided. And with no land border to easily transport goods across, the logistics and transport around the situation become exponentially more difficult. So with Europe prioritizing and purchasing these new high-quality ammunition stockpiles and emphasizing trucks and artillery, is there a worry that the equipment they're buying would be the exact opposite of the equipment that you would need for a war in Taiwan? That when that time comes around, we're bringing a bread knife to a steak dinner. With the invasion of Ukraine, a lot of parallels have been drawn to Taiwan in the sense of it is a small democratic nation that is potentially threatened by a large authoritarian neighbor, which the West may want to support indirectly, even if it's not perhaps wanting to get into a direct confrontation with said authoritarian neighbor. However, there are, yeah, there are lots of important differences geographically, politically, et cetera, et cetera, that, that really come into play here. And it's important to be mindful of them. So certainly if there were any future conflicts over Taiwan, geography dictates that the type of capabilities that the Taiwanese or anyone else involved in the conflict would need would, would necessarily be quite different. They, they would be focused clearly on, on, on kind of naval and air power and on defeating very large numbers of Chinese ships, submarines, aircraft, missiles, drones, etc., etc. And it would be very difficult to supply stuff to Taiwan in the way that you can supply stuff to Ukraine because clearly it's an island and it would be under some sort of blockade or, or threat of invasion. So there's then a wider, so that's a kind of fundamental geographical difference. There's then also a broader question around the way in which, you know, Russia or China would approach any war. And there's rightly been a lot of criticism, not only of Russia's intentions in starting the war in the first place, but also of how it has performed as a military power in the war, particularly early on with the kind of embarrassment of its failure to, to, cap, to seize the capital, Kyiv, and, and its complete underestimation of the will and capacity of the Ukrainians to fight. And we've seen all sorts of problems with Russian equipment and training, logistics and leadership and tactics and morale and all sorts of things. You can't necessarily count on that being the case. Any future war involving China or anybody else, because they, if they were sensible, they would have tried to learn some lessons from this, this Russian experience. 
And then there's also a f- kind of third point, which is the question of, well, what role would Europe, if any, be playing in that sort of a situation? So Ukraine is part of Europe geographically, politically, even though it's not part of the EU and, and NATO it obviously has ties. And, and then, you know, culturally and socially, you know, Taiwan is is very far away by comparison. So there's all sorts of problems around, first of all, what would be the political appetite of European governments and of their populations to support Taiwan in the same way that they would support Ukraine. I'm not saying that they wouldn't, but it would be a, a different conversation that would be had um, just by dint of those differences. There would be a question around the appetite for economic decoupling with China and how you manage that, just as there's been questions around how you handle the decoupling from Russia and all of the energy security problems that's thrown up and the cost of living crisis and all these issues. So all of those would have to be worked through. And then even if at that point, once you manage to kind of establish a view on how, like what your strategy was for dealing with this period crisis, it's unclear that the Europeans would be able to do a, a tremendous about, amount about it. It's clearly going to be the Americans, if they were involved in this conflict, that would be doing the lion's share, to say the least. You know, there just isn't a sizable military footprint for any European power in the Indo-Pacific. France has a small number of assets out there because it has a number of Pacific territories. The UK has increased its ambition region and has started positioning kind of very small numbers of naval assets and other things in the area, as well as doing joint exercises with people like Japan. But these are fairly token presences compared to the very large scale American Navy, Air Force, and to a lesser extent, Army presence. Really, there wouldn't be a huge role for for Europe to play beyond perhaps kind of a politically symbolic one or, or providing certain niche support. What instead the pressure might be for for Europe is to try and do more in its own backyard to enable the Americans to worry less about Europe and focus more on Pacific and China. So this is where you get into the debate about whether really the kind of European NATO allies focus should be on on Russia and dealing with European security problems and then perhaps things in their near abroad like North Africa or the Middle East, enabling the US to, to do less in those regions to pull back a little bit and, and focus its attentions more on the Pacific and the threat of China. So looking at the militaries of the British, the French and the Germans, what do you think will be the biggest doctrinal change between before the February 2022 invasion and now with the war in full swing? All of the kind of Western European allies are looking very closely at what's happening in Ukraine and have kind of various lessons learned initiatives going on within their militaries and so on to try and pick up the lessons, not just at the tactical level of, you know, what works well about a particular uh, anti-tank missile or how do the Russians hide their tanks in, in forests or whatever little kind of tactical issues they're focusing on. They're also looking at that broader picture of what, what is happening at the strategic level in terms of NATO unity and how you maintain that. What is happening in terms of the impact of economic sanctions? Do they really work? If so, how can you use them better in future? If they don't work, what do you do about that? They're thinking about the future of Russia. What happens to Russia after the war in Ukraine? What happens to Putin and his control and power? What happens to the Russian military modernization effort and their priorities? If you were to fight a war with Russia at some point in the future after Ukraine, of course, the Russians themselves would have learned a whole load of lessons and would have integrated those more or less effectively. And clearly, they've struggled to integrate past lessons from previous wars because they're they're struggling in Ukraine. But you would have to plan on there being a different Russia to the Russia that we see today. So there's a lot of uncertainty there. So I think we're at the, the point now where people recognize that there will be lessons. I think it's premature to say definitively what those lessons will be, but we are definitely picking up some examples on the battlefield and off the battlefield. So on the battlefield, we're picking up things like the need for mass. So you need numbers. It's not enough to just have a a very small number of highly capable troops or equipment because they won't last that long ultimately in a highly lethal, destructive, high tempo war, such as we're seeing in Ukraine. So you do just need mass and mass costs money. You, you need, therefore, also the kind of technology to, to enable mass, which is where you get into the discussion we had earlier around around drones and kind of cheap and cheerful dual-use um, technologies where possible. You really need to improve kind of command and control and the kill chain that links together a sensor that sees an enemy tank or an aircraft or whatever, and then passes that information through secure communication links to the people who, who need it. And then they can make an informed decision and then they can you know, deliver whatever effect, an artillery strike or a missile or whatever, as quickly as possible. Because what we're really seeing is two competing systems and you need yours to be more agile and more resilient than the other guys. 
We're also seeing lessons around the importance of logistics and the fact that that is often overlooked. We're seeing important lessons around training and the role of NCOs and junior officers and unit morale and all these sorts of things. So there's also very practical lessons that people will take away and they will debate whether it means you need more or less tanks, more or less anti-tank missiles, more or less drones, all these sorts of things. But then stepping back, there's then the broader lessons around the relationship with broader society. So Ukrainians have been successful because they have shown an ability to mobilize all of society to defend the nation. They have ex exhibited very strong political leadership from Zelensky. Uh, and they've maintained high morale and will to fight against initially very, very, very imposing odds indeed. And they, they remain very daunting even today, even after their recent successes. All of those lessons need to be learned, but it really depends on how things play out. And so this is why it's obviously important that support continues to be provided to Ukraine so that you can shape the outcomes in as positive a direction as, as possible. When I tell you defense spending is the most opaque and malleable part of the budget, I could be describing almost any nation in the world. As an example, as much as you may see the Germans stand up and say, we're committed to rebuilding the German armored forces, that statement could mean anything from, well, we're finally going to refit the German armored headquarters barracks with better Wi-Fi, to Germany committing to producing 100 next-gen state-of-the-art German tanks. And even with a commitment to those sort of tanks, there's no guarantee on how quickly they'll reach the battlefield or how usable they will be. Since the first wave of announcements regarding European rearmament, most of the opening proposals by these militaries are somewhat scattergun to say the least, with several analysts critiquing the usefulness of some of these projects. As an example, what does Master of the Seas Britain need with 100 heavy tanks when Poland is already committed to ordering hundreds of heavy tanks themselves, giving them more heavy tanks than they probably need whilst also neglecting two nations' navies. Even when we move to the French, what do the French need with more artillery? When factoring in the French cost of production, it seems highly probable that the frontline nations who actually need the artillery will most likely deem the French units to be too expensive and in risk of delay, and instead more likely choose to purchase off-the-shelf artillery from South Korea or brand new artillery from countries with cheaper labor costs like Poland or Romania. Regardless of all of that though, it's safe to say that no matter what happens in Ukraine, Russia will still be a threat for Europe. If we look at the first scenario, and Russia does achieve an outright victory in Ukraine, then Europe will begin a countdown for when Moscow rolls the dice again, either in Moldova or Georgia. On the other hand, if Ukraine achieves a victory, there's a risk Russia may be terminally wounded, and there's a high risk of the Russian sphere collapsing. As with Russia imploding, there'll be no one to keep them in check. Meaning that whilst Ukraine has victory parades through Kiev, war is more than likely breaking out everywhere from Azerbaijan to Kyrgyzstan to possibly even within Russia itself, all of which have grave security concerns for Europe. Even a best case stalemate scenario would more than likely just see Russia going back, licking its wounds, restructuring its army, and trying to take Ukraine again in a few years time. And when they come back, will NATO be able to pull out those same stops and supply Ukraine with that much equipment that quickly, like they did for the 2022 invasion. The equipment that NATO is buying today is what they'll be fighting with in five years' time, and no one knows whether the next big battles for Europe or even international security will be taking place in the jungles of Mali or the foothills of the Balkans, the familiar plains of Ukraine, or even the beaches of Taiwan. This is the question defense planners in the West have to place a bet on today desperately hoping to defy a century of European generals betting on the wrong war. Thank you so much for tuning into the show this week. It was a really interesting one to put together. I know when we were writing this episode, there was one question that kept crossing my mind. That yes, we started to understand Europe's rearmament, but how is Asia rearming? And are the Western-friendly nations of the Pacific ready for a surprise invasion of Taiwan or a North Korean march south in the same way that NATO is ready for Russia's invasion of Ukraine? And it's a question that kept rattling through the back of my head throughout the taping of this episode. And I'd imagine that for a few of you, it was probably rattling around your head as well. So instead of leaving you hanging and not answering that question, we decided to turn this episode into a two-parter, with the next fortnight's episode focusing on the Pacific rearmament what arms and materials are starting to buy up in large numbers, and what we can deduce from those purchases. 
So stick around, as that one's sure to be even more eye-opening than this one. If you want to be kept up to date when that episode eventually drops, and with all of the other upcoming content we have coming up, you can find all of our links and info on Twitter, Reddit, Instagram, Facebook, Discord, and TikTok on the handle at the Redline Pod. Or if you're keen to follow me on Twitter, I'm on the handle at MyKillyAdOz, Oz is in Australia. This show is completely funded by our amazing Patreons. And speaking of those amazing Patreons, I want to thank Sophie Eller, who is the latest Patreon to sign up as of time of recording. This show is only possible with the support of listeners like Sophie. So if you feel you could spare a couple of dollars a month, we'd greatly appreciate it. But until then, this episode focusing on European rearmament is all thanks to you, Sophie. But to Sophie and the rest of our Patreons, I look forward to seeing you at this weekend's online policy debate and roundtable. A lot of info, a lot of maps, and a lot of policy discussions, and I'm very excited to do this one again. As usual, here are our three book recommendations. The first is Putin's Wars by Mark Galliotti for a fantastic look on the structures of the Russian army and Russian defense industry. The second is White Flag by Michael Ashcroft for an examination of the UK's defense capability and a look at just how much UK domestic politics ends up shaping the nation's defense policies. And the third is Flashpoints by George Friedman for a look at some of the geopolitical flashpoints the defense planners have to begin to account for already. I want to say thanks to this week's guests, Neil Melvin, Alex Clarkson, Perun, and James Black. This was an absolutely cream of the crop panel, and we were thrilled to have them on the program today. I also want to thank my staff, Wade McCarr, the producer, Perry Grace, Daniel Luzavella, Genevieve Donald May, Nate Ostiller, Nick McNally, Sean Cotter-Lem, Isaac Gibbs, Ahmad Al Ahmad, Andrew Garbery, and Robbie Sutton, our research assistants and writers, Jamie Tanu, our media director, Francis Leach, our director of Breaking News, Mark Spencer, our second voiceover artist, Derek Henry Flood, our deputy editor, Jonah Gunn, our production assistant, Ross Crabtree, our media advisor, Joe Hawthorne, our audio cleaner, Marissa Rafter, our videographer, and Nick Much, our field correspondent. The team has been putting out some amazing analysis and articles on our website, and I highly encourage you to go check that out for incredibly well-researched and poignant geopolitical analysis that just isn't quite big enough to do a full Redline episode on. The Red Line will be back in another fortnight with another international episode. But until then, thank you for listening and good night. The views and opinions expressed in this episode are solely those of Michael, our guests, and the Red Line podcast. They do not represent any government or organization and are solely our own. For more information, please visit theredlinepodcast.com.